the franchise owners are a group of very, very special people. And the coaches are a group of very, very special people. Mm -hmm. And the franchise team is a group of exceptional people. And that, that is what life and business is all about. The quality of your life depends on the quality of your relationships, whether it's in mm -hmm. your family, mm -hmm. your friends, mm -hmm. or in business. And I mm -hmm. work with my friends, and I work with my family, and we all do business together. So I get all three. And if you can have quality relationships from the, from the moment you wake up to the moment you fall asleep, and everyone you wor are working with is someone that you enjoy working with, and it's a, it's a pretty cool situation. That, that's kind of everything. Yeah. All the other stuff is secondary. Yeah. It's like, how much do yeah. I enjoy my day? Am I having a good time? Because I like to work hard, but I only like to work hard if it's towards something that I care about with people that I enjoy working with because nothing gets yeah. done by yourself, especially yeah. with my skill set. My skill set is about mm -hmm. bringing people together to build something special. Okay, welcome back. Today the show is about me, I guess. You know, wanted to interview me. So I agreed because we need to get some content out and this should be pretty easy. So mm -hmm. Ina, do my job. Mm -hmm. Take it away. Excellent. So I'm here today with Ray Gillenwater, who's the president and co-founder of Starting Strength Gyms. He's working on building 100 gyms in five years to make training in person with a starting strength coach more accessible for more people. Ray is not only a business strategist, but he's also a starting strength coach. And along with his siblings, Ben and Jen, Ray is partnering with Rip and Steph and the Asgard company to bring something new to the fitness industry, something that actually helps people get strong. So Ray, welcome to your own podcast. Damn, you had that planned out, didn't you? <laughs> you know, intro. Ray, there's a lot of people, believe it or not, there are a lot of people who don't know who you are mm. or what starting strength is. And, Quite honestly, um, I prefer it to be that way, but someone's got to tell the story about what the hell we're doing. So here we are. Yes, yes. And uh, and in preparation for this podcast, I thought, well, there's so many things that you've done and there's so much to tell. You know, where do I start? Um, and I thought it, it, something struck me um, when we first spoke. You once said that you would not be in the gym business if it wasn't for starting strength. For sure. So I want to know when was when was it that you realized that starting strength gyms needed to happen and was a missing component to the books, the seminar, uh, and everything that starting strength was already producing? What made you realize this was the next logical step? I don't know. The way my brain works is with business opportunities, I can just kind of see things. Um, I can see holes in the market. I can see unfulfilled demand. I can see things that need to be built that aren't built yet. Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. Uh, that's the fun of entrepreneurship, right? But um, mm -hmm. my brain works that way whether or not I'll be doing the entrepreneurial endeavor myself. <clears throat> so for starting Strength Gyms, I think the first time I had the idea was after I read the book. I had just assumed that there were gyms all over the country and probably all over the world because I'd read the book. It made a lot of sense. I tried the program. It worked. It actually worked for the first time ever in my life. A fitness program worked really well. And so I, I believe I searched for Starting Strength Irvine, which is where I planned mm -hmm. on, on moving to after my stint in Asia uh, mm -hmm. back home. And... Um, there was no starting strength Irvine. And I'm just like, why is there no starting strength Irvine? It, it seems obvious, right? Mm -hmm. um, and after getting to know Rip and Steph, I can see why that is. I mean, they're, uh, they are academics, they're experts. They, um, and, and I don't mean academic in the derogatory sense, by the way. <laughs> these, are, <laughs> these are actual students, uh, these are scientists, these are people that discover things, that innovate, that create things, that iterate. These are, um, these are true inventors and, and these are not marketers. Uh, these are business people by, uh, you know, because they, they have to be to bring this thing to market, but not business people in the traditional sense. And in, in, in other words, Steph and Rip are not setting out to say, hey, how do we make this brand as big as possible? Instead, they're saying, how do we 
how do we communicate the most effective way to make yourself stronger um, to as many people as possible? So there's a, there's a difference. And, uh, you know, Rip, Rip is extremely bright in, in many ways, but especially in the sense that he does not get involved with stuff that he knows will likely add unwanted overhead to his life because he gets approached by people all the time. Let's do the starting strength boot. Let's do the starting strength this, the starting strength that. And he's smart. He goes, cool, you can license the brand and then send me a check. You know, and, and he's extraordinarily fair. He, he doesn't ask for much. He just wants to grow the brand and develop good products when it, when it comes to that stuff. So him doing this thing with me was actually out of his um, comfort zone to an extent. And just, you know, I have a tendency to overshare a bit. I don't, I don't really care. I'll, I'll talk to Rip and make sure he's cool with this. But um, I'll just tell you guys straight up, you know, Rip wanted to charge me 5% like he does everybody. Anybody that comes in, give 5% to the Asgard company, and then you can use the starting strength brand. And as long as you don't fuck it up, that'll work out pretty well. Um, it's when people start, you know, well, we, we actually won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's been problems with that in the past, obviously. Mm -hmm. So my rebuttal to him was, Rip, that's really generous, and I appreciate that, but the only way this thing will work is if it's important to you. And the way to make it important to you is to give you an ownership stake in the company. So instead of 5% licensing, I actually want you to own 10% of the company. And then um, I just had I just did a, a podcast that'll come out soon talking about... Um, we're cash flow positive and how we got there and all this and that. And in that podcast, I talk about how Rip invested his own money in this thing. It took a big bet. I did too. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the way this needs to work. There has to be skin in the game from all parties involved. Everybody has to be, this can't be my own thing, my own brand, licensing his thing. We're separate. It has to be, we are all, we are all starting strength. We're all trying to grow the brand. We're all trying to do what's right. We're all trying to kick as much ass as possible. And Rip was, Rip was game for the challenge. And I told him, although you're an owner of the company, it'll be an economic in interest only. You don't have to worry about um, management, oversight, meetings, all this other stuff. And I include him in things that, that we could use his brain on, which, which certainly goes much further than strength training because the guy has such mm -hmm. a way of analyzing situations and breaking them down to the the simplest most obvious form and he communicates that in such in a way where you're almost like I feel stupid for not thinking that myself and when you when you can bring rip into a conversation about whatever growth market selection franchisee selection how we're going to respond to covid all this other stuff his judgment is fantastic just just as a quick mm -hmm. aside you know this but the audience may not Mark Ripito could have been an innovator in any industry. He could have taken mm -hmm. that brain and that ability to break things down to first principles and not be, not have his opinion colored by conventional wisdom. And he could have done that anywhere. It, we just happened to be very lucky that a mind like that decided to dedicate his brain power, his, uh, his efforts towards understanding the way the body works and then understanding how to make it better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember you telling me that um, when you realized how much, you know, activity there was on the forum, how, you know, I mean, Rip's, you know, an animal on that forum. He's just completely in there uh, day and night. And when you realized how much activity was going on and, and uh, you realized that there was there was an opportunity for the gyms because here people are in different states and different cities, all doing the same thing, right? Doing starting strength with no gym location, yeah. which just seemed which just seemed crazy at the time. Yeah, I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't actually know how big starting strength was. So I actually, I thought this was a good idea before I knew how big starting strength was because I had the, the, you know, the starting strength Irvine, like kind of storefront sign in my mind way back when. And then um, I had opened a gym. I'd opened a gym with Grant Brogy in California, uh, the Strength Co. And um, we did that because, well, my motivation was I kind of wanted to have somewhere else to train the 24-hour fitness. And would it turn into a successful business? Maybe, you know, who knows? That's the thing about entrepreneurship. You just kind of roll the dice. Doesn't matter how good you think your ideas are, the market mm -hmm. thinks they're good or, or it doesn't, and that'll dictate your success. So we opened that gym and, uh, you know, the thing was cash flow positive before the doors opened, thanks to Grant and all the work he did to, um, you know, create a membership base out of his garage there. 
And then uh, was making good money within a couple of months, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And we only had two sessions per night. We were closed all day because I was running a wow. tech startup and Grant was uh, a captain in the Marine Corps. So there's this gym that's making money that's closed all day with two sessions per night. And people are anxious to spend $300 a month to train with a coach three times a week because they can't get that level of coaching anywhere else and they can't get that level of results anywhere else. And so mm -hmm. I was ready to go. I wanted to build, build, build. Um, and it didn't work out between me and Grant. We had different goals and timelines, but um, everything tended to work out because now Grant's in the equipment business and he's supplying the gyms and now I'm in the franchising business and we're growing these things around the country. Yeah, yeah, his plates are beautiful. Yeah. I, I really love seeing all the gyms put up strength go plates. Yeah. Um, you you recently released a podcast uh, that people really enjoyed listening to with your siblings, with Ben and Jen. That did and, pretty well. Um, I was like, well, what in the that, hell? These people want to listen to this nerd yes. talk about construction? <laughs> I was yes. surprised. Well, YouTube well, is so you weird. Know what? You know what? I really have to say that I think Jen was the highlight, no offense, of that podcast. We all admit um, she's the most pleasant, smartest gill in water, so that's fine. You can say that. <laughs> it's, you know, in addition to just, you know, being an inspiration because she's a working mom and, and, she, and she's now like the mama bear of the company, she's extremely bright and capable and uh, the gym owners are so fortunate to have her support behind them. And uh, I think people really enjoyed seeing that your or that your company that the franchise is really you know a, a three siblings who are uh invested in in doing the right thing and helping people get stronger but tell me um a little bit more about each one of their roles but also how did you how did you get them to agree to to go in on this to go all in is it were they lifting is it something that who thought of this and said okay let's do this together mm -hmm. The summary is, I have really talented siblings, and it just so happens that our that our talents complement each other really well. You know, Ben uh, Ben is the most talented technology executive I've ever worked with. I, I know one person who's more technically proficient than Ben, and I know plenty of executives that are that are uh, better executives than Ben, just in terms of experience and things they've accomplished. But in terms of people that know both to his level, he's the best in the world that I've ever met. I'm sure there are better out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it just so happens that Ben is allergic to corporate bullshit. He's allergic mm -hmm. to politics. He's allergic to lies. He's allergic to people doing things for image instead of for purpose. And he has kind of just been cruising along doing freelance stuff after he quit his government gig and then, and then quit his BlackBerry gig where he was working with me in Asia. And since then, he's been doing entrepreneurship, he's been doing freelance and just kind of cruising along, making ends meet, being the dude, having a good time. And, uh, and so I asked him for help because I could do a lot of the stuff myself, but I can tell you for sure we would have more problems and we wouldn't have as good of a member experience if I tried to do it myself. And we'd have to spend more money on hiring people not as good as him to do stuff for us. So um, Ben really saved our ass because every company is a tech company and Ben took my vision for how the experience needs to function and then built a bunch of custom apps and then built a bunch of IT systems in a really smooth automated way so that running a gym is not an administrative chore. It's pretty automated, it's pretty simple. And then you have my sister, <clears throat> she's the only educated one of us all. Her and I both dropped out of high school. Uh, ben was the only one that finished high school, but he um, was skipped all his classes and just went to auto shop and built cars all day. He literally built cars in high school. <laughs> so Jen went on to... Actually, no, Ben, Ben, I take it back. Uh, ben became an expert in IT and then tested out of a bunch of classes and got an online master's degree in information go. technology or something. Yeah, I got, a, I got a BA that took me nine years in, in communications. Yeah. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> I just needed the, I needed the degree so I can get a work permit overseas. Um, right. And then Jen actually went on to become an engineer. She's the one with a real science education. She is, um, man, she's got a special brain for sure. Um, but what, so, but I fill in some of the gaps for her. So what I lack in terms of detailed technical understanding in the way that physical and electrical things work and how they function, um, I make up for in my ability to uh, develop a vision and create a plan and lead and administer a business um, and then make sure everything is functioning in a way that benefits everybody. 
So what a great combination of skills, right? Ben is an online engineer in the network and digital world, and Jen is an offline engineer, water resources, construction, a bunch of other things. And then I'm a guy that knows how to, how to pick talent, how to leverage talent, how to build a vision, how to build a plan, and how to implement a plan step by step by step by step with precision and uh, financial efficiency. So, mm -hmm. I mean, shit, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good team. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you talked about the member experience. Um, tell me about the, the physical design of the gym and how, how you, how you, you know, figure out how to lay out the platforms, what, um, what spacing you want, how it has to be designed, you know, how you're choosing the physical property, you know, how does the physical design of the gym contribute to the member experience? Well, the first thing is discoverability because I don't care how good your product, service, business is. Uh, if nobody nobody knows about it, then they don't get to enjoy it. So the mm -hmm. first thing about our member experience is that it's it's easy to discover the gym, so you can have an experience in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's easy to discover the gym if you're a starting strength fan because you'll see a banner ad that's geo targeted that tells you about gyms that are near you. It's easy to discover the gym if you were in a major metro area where we're opening a gym because we put these things on major thoroughfares that get a whole bunch of traffic passing by the storefront signs every day. Mm -hmm. And then once you discover the gym and you come in, um, we've designed the thing to be as efficient as possible. The toughest, the, the, for anyone out there trying to build a business, you will always have more things you can do. And the discipline is about deciding the things that are most important. So I had argument after argument with people that were trying to convince me to put in a leg press machine and a lat pull down machine and airdyne bikes and a track for a prowler and all and dumbbells and all this other stuff. And it's like, you don't need it. You don't need it. Could you use it? Sure, but you don't actually need it. And so what do we need? What we need is the stuff that's required for starting strength. So the gyms are built to spec just for starting strength. And you've used the phrase before, blue book come to life. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. So these gyms are not fancy. We don't need a whole bunch of equipment. We don't need a whole bunch of space. We just need platforms. We need, you know, seven to 10 platforms in a retail space. And if it's retail, we're paying twice the rent per month versus industrial. So what does that mean? That means we need to be very efficient with our space because cost per square foot is high. Therefore, revenue per square foot needs to be maximized. And the best way to do that is to reduce the number of square feet to as little as possible without compromising the member experience. So how do you do that? Well, at the current moment, we're giving everybody their own platform. So you got all your own space and you got a spot you can sit down at, you've got a spot you can write your warm ups on, you've got a spot you can hang your towel and put your cup. Um, so you have your own spot on the, on the platform. And then if the gym is wide enough, we need at least 19 and a half feet. We actually put the bench press, uh, instead of having the benches against the wall, we take the benches for the bench press and put them out in the, um, uh, in the walkway. And what that does is in between sets, it forces people to sit down out in the walkway and interact with each other. So at Austin, mm -hmm. when, uh, when we did this, for example, people started talking more, started connecting more, having a better time, getting to know each other better, hanging out outside of the gym more. And that's, that's what this is all about. I mean, yes, we're here to make people better, but we understand human behavior. How do you make people better? Well, you've got to make it really accessible. You've got to make it rewarding. You've got to make it enjoyable. You've got to make the progress measurable. And then you have to make the environment fantastic. Just really, you feel good in there between the, the lighting and the aesthetics and the sound and the demeanor of the coaches and the quality of the other members in the gym. All this stuff adds up to member experience. And we are not cheap. We're, we are charging a premium so that these franchisees have an incentive to open gyms and our coaches have an incentive to work in these gyms. And to provide in financial incentives to both of those people and to provide a high quality service, we have to charge a lot of money. So our gyms to train three times a week with the coach, it's anywhere from 24 to $35 a session, depending on the market. And that, that translates to 315 to $455 a month. So if you go to starting strength Houston, you're paying $455 a month. Your coach is a starting strength coach, you know, JD or Josh or Shelly Wells. And, uh, the other people there are die hard. Like all the people on the YouTube channel, we've done mm -hmm. case studies on and the staff kicks ass and the, the aesthetic is perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, I might be biased, <laughs> but uh, you know, wh wh whether it's coming into the gym and checking out what your warmups are for the day or going into your logbook and, and logging your workout, um, mm -hmm. 
whether it's mm-hmm. even signing up for the gym, something as simple as signing up for the gym. What what is what is your first impression of Starting Strength Houston? Okay, so let's say you, you don't know anything about Starting Strength. You pass by the storefront sign on your way to another retail shop. You go, oh, Starting Strength. You look it up later. Okay, cool. Google Maps, all five star reviews, excellent. You're like, uh, you know what? I've been looking for strength. I'm just going to sign up. And and um, a lot of our gyms, Austin, for example, gets half of their sign up sight unseen. People just go to the website and just sign up. And we've had people tell us, by the way, they've signed up because it's so easy. Once they yes. saw how simple it is to sign up, they just went for it. And we, we get a lot of yeah. props from software people, which we which flatters yeah. us. Um, so, okay, then, then what happens? Well, um, then you get a call. Well, that's cool. I just signed up for a business. I paid them already, and they're going out of the way to talk to me. Great. Mm-hmm. So you get a call from the owner in most cases. And then the owner, the owner's not trying to sell you anything. You're already, you've already bought. Right. So then the owner is just trying yeah. to understand what's your situation. Uh, what do we need to know? What, uh, more importantly, what do you know or not know about us? And how do we slowly drip feed you information so that you're more clear on what it is we're actually doing, which will increase your level of buy in, which will increase your consistency in the gym. And if you're consistent, you will get phenomenal results. And if you get phenomenal results, you're going to stick around a long time. You're going to refer your friends. You're going to leave us a good five-star review. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Have, all the components of the system have to add up to that member experience, and it has to be consistent every single time. And mm-hmm. th- that's that's uh, that's our standard, and we don't accept anything less. Yeah, and one of the things that's very noticeable, uh, what's what's different among the, all the things different about starting strength gyms from all other gyms, is that there is no sales desk. There's no front desk. Um, Usually people feel, you know, intimidated when they come into a gym, they're, you know, kind of attacked by someone that's just trying to make the sale, uh, not really asking them about their goals. And there's a sales desk that you try to get past knowing like, ah, I'm going to commit to something. I don't know what I'm doing. Right. And starting string gyms does not have a front desk. Yeah. Well, why is that? Um, well, you can start a company one of two ways or somewhere in between. You can say, I'm going to do things the way things have always been done. Or you can say, I'm going to do things in a way that I think makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. And I am not a fan of being a part of a company that does things to its customers that I would not want done to me. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I moved into the big house with Jen and Ben, when we started this company, I had to find a gym because the strength code was too far. So Mm -hmm. I went to uh, LA Fitness because I actually know the guys that run LA Fitness. We were working on a deal for a while. I thought I'd go talk to one of their guys and give them some feedback. Um, and we went into, I, I went into LA Fitness and uh, I was like, so what does it cost per month? And like, oh, come over and sit down with me. I'm like, right. I'm, I'm not buying a car. What do you, like, yeah. just tell me what it costs to train, right? And, and, yeah. and uh, whenever someone won't give you a direct answer on price, or they want to give you all these options and write stuff down and talk about the special today only. It's like, I don't want to train here anymore. Fuck you. Right. So, yeah. so that's yeah. exactly what I did. I left. And I went yeah. to 24 Hour Fitness, which uh, I've been referring to as a public toilet. And um, that's what it feels like to be in there. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I trained there because yeah. I had to. Their equipment sucks. Their floors all chewed up from people dropping deadlifts. Um, their barbells are crap. They're bent. Their plates are octagonal. It's a disaster training experience. You know, it's it's really motivating mirrors. to build something better. Yeah, You've got yeah. mirrors. Can't use chalk. Yeah, you know. So, no, <laughs> we're yeah. not doing that. We're not doing that. I want I want yeah. something better. I want things to be done reasonably and rationally. If I can't create a business that provides you with so much value that the that um, that you, I don't need to trick you into signing up and then I don't need to trick you into signing up for a long-term agreement. And then you'll actually show up to the gym. Then I've won. But on the other hand, if I have to do a bunch of gross sales tactics to try to confuse you and get you to sign up for something you don't fully understand so that I can take advantage of you, well then, um, that kind of makes me a piece of shit, doesn't it? So, um, maybe that's, maybe that's the theme. We should try not to be pieces of shit to our members. We should try to treat them like people we care about because we do, we actually offer something that makes these people better and we want to make these people better and we have to get paid in order to do that. So we don't have to do something else and we can spend our time making these people better. And that's a fair Mm -hmm. transaction. That's two people exchanging value in a way that's reasonable. And that's to me how business should be conducted. Yeah. And the members really appreciate it because anybody who's uh, a serious trainee 
and uh, is looking for the right training environment. When they walk into starting strength gyms, they, they see exactly the equipment that they need. It's available to them. You know, they're not being punished for using chalk. They're not being distracted in the mirrors. They're not having to share racks with people that are doing things that doesn't make sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they're relieved when they find the gyms and that it's a perfect training environment. But, but really, um, I think what distinguishes the gyms from all other gyms are, is the coaching team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you initially built the business uh, plan for the franchise company, you did so in a way that ensures that each franchise gym would serve as a coach development center. And I think that this really adds value to each one of your facilities. Um, I think it was a very important piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about, you know, the vision you had when you, when you decided that it was going to really center around the coach and that this would be a uh, sort of career development center for the coaches. Yeah. Well, this thing is all about coaching. If a franchisee who's not a coach builds a gym, it's a beautiful facility in a good location where people can go and do what they do at other gyms and confuse themselves about what's effective and how to perform lifts and what lifts to do and how much weight on the bar and how many reps and how many sets. So the, the gym is a fulfillment mechanism. The gym is not what matters. What matters is the coaching. The coach is the person that takes you from where you are right now to much, much closer to your physical potential and psychological potential for that matter. Yeah. So this is all about the coach. It's always been about the coach. And the question is, how do we get people that are bright? How do we get people that are hardworking, that, that care, that really give a shit about other people? And the answer to that question is to not do things the way the old fitness industry d did things or does mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. The answer to that question is to not pay people minimum wage and then make it so that the only way they can earn money is if they get commission on pushing stuff on people that they don't want. Mm -hmm. The way that you do that is, is you don't, you don't have any commission involved. What, what is, I mean, uh, uh, as Rip says, a, a starting strength coach is an engineer of human health and performance. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you need a commission structure for an engineer? Engineers are not on commission. Engineers are responsible mm -hmm. for building things effectively that will last. And in mm -hmm. our case, that's what we're doing for people. So when you come into one of our gyms, no one's pushing anything on you because that's not their job. Their job instead is to consult with you. Their job is to say, what is your situation? What are you trying to achieve? What are your limitations? Let me find everything out about you and then tell you how we might be able to help you or not. We are not a good fit for everybody. Mm -hmm. If you wanna be on the keto diet and run five miles every day, um, yeah. we can do our best, but this is probably not the best fit for you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, it's always about people. Coaches are our most important people. And the way I designed the job is, so we recommend firstly that no gym owner puts a coach on a split shift just because that sucks. Mm -hmm. And the coach experience mm -hmm. is crucial too. Mm -hmm. So if you're an evening coach, you can show up at 445. You've got three 90 minute sessions. You have five days a week, maybe six, and then you're done. You don't need to prep. You don't need to bring tools. You don't need to be equipment. There's no hard labor. Mm -hmm. You're in an air conditioned mm -hmm. room and you're a stud. You walk in and people are paying real money, good money to hear what you have to tell them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have something good to tell them, then you can't be a coach in our gym. And the way that we certify that you have something good to tell them is we make sure you're an SSC. And if you're not an SSC and you're coaching people, it's under the guidance of an SSC mm -hmm. and you're in the prep course with a scheduled date to become an, or at least take the test to become an SSC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, when I um, recently, I visited Ford Hood for the career fair uh, with Jacob Pierce, who's a coach at Orlando, soon to be head coach of Tampa and um, veteran himself. And one of the things that stood out to me was how um, many of the um, military um, person that were transitioning out of the military and looking for a career, they were really enthralled with the idea that they could take their passion for strength training, their passion for, you know, helping people get stronger and turn it into a real career where they weren't just having to fool around with some sort of sales tactics, like you said, you know, um, to, you know, where 
in a regular gym, you know, the, the quota, how many people do they turn over? You know, that's really what their role is. And here we're saying, no, you're a professional. You're going to execute, you know, the starting strength model. Um, each time you're a professional, this is your expertise and you're going to be in the gym coaching and you'll be respected as a professional. And they absolutely love this opportunity. And I had so many people come up to me and say, this is, this is for me. I, I don't want to get out and do hard labor jobs. I've already worked in that way. I want to come out and, and, you know, I want to build a meaningful career. I want to find something that I can do that, you know, doesn't break me. Um, they, they think this is an incredible opportunity. When I described the job to them, they couldn't believe it, you know, and um, it's thanks to starting strength gyms and, and to the credential that they are valued professionals. This is now one of those um, apprenticeships that are covered through the GI Bill and- The only can, national gym chain, by the way, that has yeah. a nationally recognized apprenticeship program that's covered by the yeah. GI Bill, thanks to John Miller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, John Miller and Outlaws Inc., his company, um, you know, helps so many veterans find valuable and meaningful careers. And this was one of the things that was very attractive to people because uh, the more conversations we had, the more I, I heard over and over how people wanted to just get out and have meaning in their work. They wanted to feel useful and like they were making a difference in society. They didn't want to just go and, and, and do labor jobs. You know, they wanted to be creative. They wanted to feel like they were, you know, impacting their community and, uh, they couldn't believe this opportunity. When I explained to them how the whole gym is really designed around them, mm. um, I could see smiles on their faces. And, and I've been speaking to veterans ever since and, and connecting them with our gyms. So it's- uh, The corporate gym chains don't give a shit about their coaches. They're expendable. Yeah. If you're cute yes. and you're college aged and you're yes. willing to be uh, paid very little for mm -hmm. high pressure work where you have to deliver numbers and those numbers reflect your lack of ethics in your interactions mm -hmm. with strangers, then uh, then great. And as soon as you don't serve that purpose, you're disposable and they'll move on to the next yes. one. Yes, yes, indeed. And so, you know, Starting Strength Gyms has really become a place not just for members to, <clears throat> you know, find the right training environment, but also for people to build a future for themselves as, as, a, as a career, as a starting strength coach. And so I think that makes the gyms very special. Um, when we let's talk you know, about when that I for think a sec. about I'm sorry yeah. sorry to cut you off so yeah good we're, we're at a we're at a weird time in history right imagine well you've got you've got kids that are roughly the age of trying to figure out yes. what they're going to do but you're a Jewish mother so you're pushing for doctor and lawyer they um, already know what they're going to do <laughs> <laughs> they're already doing they're doing what mom said but we're in a really strange time where uh any young person that asks me if they should go to school unless they have a really good reason specific to their situation I, I think Rip has this right. The answer is no, unless you're getting a hard science degree. Mm -hmm. Don't bother going to get an ad degree. You know, when I went to ad school, it was already five years behind. And it's just like, and the people teaching were not practitioners. The people have never been in the job market or, or if they had, it's been a long time and they weren't very good. That's why they're teaching. So if you want, if you want education, if you want to learn how things actually work, you have to do things. You need practical experience mm -hmm. and apprenticeship is the way to do that. And unfortunately, this country does not have very good apprenticeship programs in general, um, at least compared to places that I hear are better like Germany, right? And they've got educational pathways that are more clear for people that want to become apprentices versus, or, or become uh, skilled workers versus mm -hmm. knowledge workers, let's say. But, you know, our coaches are knowledge workers um, and, and they're skilled workers. So I'm trying to think if I was, if I was young and trying to figure out where I was going in my career and I wasn't trying to be an entrepreneur, uh, I don't know what I would do, but I, I can tell you that yeah. this, this gym thing would be very interesting to me because mm -hmm. you want to be in a position where you're respected. You want to be in a position of expertise. You want, you want to, if you're skilled and smart and talented, you want to push yourself and see how far you can take that. And, and something like the SSC really does that because the pass rate is so low and the material is so complicated. Simple but not easy is a better way to put it. Um, mm -hmm. So all, all of this... To say that uh, you know, you can you can do you can do those things, and then you can actually make a good living. And then, if you're really ambitious, you might want to save some money or partner with someone and open up a gym yourself someday. So it's mm -hmm. I don't know. I like the way Nick Delgadillo puts it: monetize your hobbies. Um, 
Mm-hmm. It, it can be good and it can be bad because if you monetize your hobby in the wrong way, you can spoil your hobby. But um, if you know what you're doing and you're conscientious, you can monetize your hobby and you can have a damn good time and a good career and more importantly, a good career path. And my point in saying all that is I just don't think nowadays the outlook for most young people and the paths that are available to become successful and do great things in a career, to me, they seem uh, they don't seem as clear, or obvious or attractive as they used to be. No, no. The new generation um, of kids now is either, you know, building businesses themselves using technology and all the access they have at their fingertips um, to create their own brands, uh, or they're choosing um, less bureaucratic paths um, to to earning money. And when I speak with personal trainers who have been, you know, in this business for a while, uh, the thing that really stands out to them in each conversation is that I tell them that they will be skilled and specialized and respected. Mm. Um, when they become coaches and it makes them feel, I can tell that it makes a difference to them when I tell them that they'll be respected for in their position because they will really be experts at coaching the starting strength model. And that is valuable enough to build gyms around. So yeah. And imagine going to work and and having that level of respect, going to work. Mm -hmm. And as you, when you walk into the room, people are happy to see you and they're anxious to hear what you have to say to them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you walk out of work, knowing you made just a tremendous difference in someone's life, whether it was to help a grandmother uh, regain her lower body strength so she could function better at home yep. or to help somebody rehab from an injury. And now they can, you know, be more, uh, more successful at work or better with their family. I mean, the, 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 the value of getting people stronger, no matter where they are in life, no matter what their limitations the value of that is, I think, difficult to measure. And mm. when people walk out of work feeling good about their job, feeling good about what they accomplished, I think that it's, I think that it makes that position really something very rare yeah. and very meaningful to people. They better be careful too. I, we tell this to coaches a lot, you know, that there's so much trust in the starting strength brand mm. that when you're in one of our gyms, people are going to ask you questions, assuming you may be more qualified to answer a question than you actually are. So then Mm -hmm. the, the onus is on you to -hmm. be ethical and to be honest Mm -hmm. and to be Mm -hmm. honest with yourself and with the member about the, the depths of what you do and don't know. Mm -hmm. And if you're out of your depth, don't be an MD or don't Mm -hmm. be the 22 year old jackass at, at uh, 24 hour fitness. Don't just make something up. Don't just say something, say, (laughs) I don't know. Interesting question, let me find out. And get back to the person to build more trust and to demonstrate that this brand is not about blowing smoke up people's asses like all the other fitness stuff in the industry. So mm-hmm. yeah, there, with, with uh, that level of trust comes a lot of responsibility. And um, mm-hmm. for those coaches, of, those, those of you out there that are coaches that are watching this, please keep yeah. that in mind and we'll continue to remind you, take that responsibility very seriously. Well, um, so the, one thing that people don't see is just the interaction that happens in our um, private Slack channels where the coaches bring up scenarios all the time and collaborate together to solve problems. I think that's really a neat component of the starting strength uh, coaches amongst the gyms is, you know, they're always sharing different experiences and, and, and calling on each other's strengths to solve problems. Um, a lot of them are very humble that way and um, really work together beautifully. I love seeing them bring up an issue with a client and then having feedback from somebody who is maybe a physical therapy background and can give them some input, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's really neat about the gyms and about the coaches is the way they work together because the real intent here, the real intent and the real priority is the member mm. and, you know, delivering that service and making sure that we're giving them the best um, that we have the knowledge, the experience, the the problem solving, and staying within our scope of practice. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say that, you know, um, one of the things that really stood out to me, whenever I visit the gyms, one of the things that really stands out to me is the focus that these coaches have while they're working. Mm. Um, I think the design of the gyms first of all, makes it very easy for the coach to take care of their trainee. Mm. But I always enjoy watching the coach focusing and analyzing and assessing and, and, and really connecting with his or her member. And when a new uh, personal trainer, let's say, asks me, you know, 
they're used to just counting reps, yeah. right? And yeah. it's very difficult to explain to them exactly what they're seeing when they're seeing a coach give feedback. Mm. Um, and that's something very different about starting strength. And it always strikes something in me. And like, you know, I spent so many years in the fitness industry. And the reason I was great is because, you know, maybe personality, right? Maybe I was able to mix and match all the different hit programs and maybe my dance background, whatever it was. But until I found starting strength, I didn't really have a, a skill that I could practice confidently. Mm. Um, and I didn't really understand what that communication should be. I didn't know what I should be looking at. And now to see a coach working with a trainee, um, the way that we're able to reproduce that through this coach development program, uh, the feedback that they're giving, uh, that relationship that they're building, the communication, it's, um, it's really incredible to see because when a new person comes in and they just enter the coach development program, they haven't really developed their coach's eye yet. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of are all over when they see a trainee, but when you see a, a starting strength coach really honing in um, really practicing their skill. It's really beautiful to see. Mm. They're so zoned in. The attention is, you know, full on with, with the trainee, is with the trainee when the trainee is moving, really connected to them, coaching them in real time, correcting problems in real time. And it's so exciting to the coach. Uh, they love their jobs because of it. You know, it's one of the things that we're always hashtagging or joking with each other every time we see um, a coach share something with a member uh, their success, we're always saying best job ever. Mm -hmm. And that's because you share in the member's success because you're connected to them in a different way than you might be if you didn't have this model. Yeah. And I love seeing that in all of the gyms that the, the coaches are so tuned in with their members. And the way uh, you know it's not bullshit, by the way, Ina, is whether it's this coach you're referring to, this hypothetical coach, hypothetical coach on the platform, you, me, Rip, we're all right. going to see the same stuff. We're all going to correct mm -hmm. the same things. And mm -hmm. members really like that because in the past, mm -hmm. all they've experienced is either rep counting or random feedback that can't be explained. That's different mm -hmm. than the feedback they might get from another trainer at the gym. And neither mm -hmm. of them can explain why their feedback's different than the other person's or why mm -hmm. other than this is the way why? I learned it. This is the way it's always been done. Why it should be performed this way. Yeah. And the word why is exactly what distinguishes starting strength from all of the other, uh, you know, practices out there is that we're able to explain why we're having you do the particular thing that you're doing. I mean, I think that even in the design of the gym, there's always an answer for why, whether mm -hmm. you're, and if you're coaching, there's an answer for why you're giving the cues you are. And that's, that's the beauty of this whole system is that none of this is, you know, because Rip said it should be that way. Although maybe, <laughs> But uh, a lot of this is, is not not in the gyms, uh, actually. I mean, we joke about yeah. it, but but no, there there are no yeah. sacred cows. There are right. no religious cult leaders whose word is That's final. Right. This is actual right. science in practice. Yeah. If there's a yeah. theory, we take it to the lab, which is our gym. And we see mm -hmm. if the theory proves out and is repeatable like that. and is peer reviewed. And if it mm -hmm. is, then the theory is correct. Then if mm -hmm. we find something that we missed, we make an enhancement, we make an improvement. Mm -hmm. This is not about mm -hmm. beliefs. This is about mm -hmm. one of the few things in life that is provable and repeatable. Mm -hmm. And then the trainee, you know, usually winds up buying the starting strength book, reading uh, about the lifts and realizing, okay, this syncs with what I'm being taught on the gym floor. And um, they really personalize the whole experience. It becomes theirs. Like we're teaching them a skill that they're going to take with them throughout life. And whether they're on the road and they need to train, now they know how to do it on their own, right? Now they have a program and they have a system that makes sense. And they can, you know, this isn't just something that, that you pay for at the gym and you can only have it at the gym, you know, it's yours to have for life. And so we're helping you refine it at the gyms and we're helping you gain progress, but ultimately you're learning a skill. You're learning something that you'll have for the rest of your life. And coaching um, helps you in many aspects of life. It makes... Yeah. Uh, for me at least, communication in a relationship clearer because coaching mm -hmm. forces you to be concise and direct and clear, which mm -hmm. is useful. Mm -hmm. It's especially useful in emergencies. I find I found myself helping some guy that was choking to the extent that he needed the Heimlich at a restaurant a few weeks back. Mm -hmm. And um, someone weak and small performed the Heimlich and the thing just got jammed in his throat. And I was sitting there coaching him through breathing and relaxing while we we're waiting for EMS to come. And 
as I was doing that, I'm thinking to myself, man, man I'm glad I'm a coach because I'm I'm clear, I'm authoritative, and he's not even questioning. He's just listening to what I'm saying, and this is right. changing his outcome. He can actually relax, which means he needs less right. oxygen, which means he can mm -hmm. sip the little bit of oxygen that he can get past that blockage in his throat and stay mm -hmm. conscious while the paramedics come. Um, mm -hmm. Just one example of many in, in which, in, in the way that becoming a coach has helped me, and it's pretty surprising. In, you know, in uh, in managing kids, coaching helps you. In um, mm -hmm. in just personal interactions, just confidence, presence. Mm -hmm. You know, one one of uh, one of the newer coaches I won't name and shame because um, there's no shame. This is just part of growing up and and developing. Young guy became a head coach at a young age, and I didn't know how to put this to him, but I said, "You need to work on your presence." So like, well, what does that mean? It's like, well, when you're on the platform, are you standing there with your shoulders back, relaxed and confident, or is, or is your body length, is it kind of, are you shrinking away, turned away from the client, looking down? When you give a cue, is it firm and clear? Or is it, uh, oh, can you, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's you, you, need, you need a commanding presence, and I don't, I don't want you to fake it. I don't want you to say things you're not sure about. What I want you to do is decide in your head, do I know this to be true or not? And if I know it to be true, decisively and confidently communicate it. And if you don't know it to be true, just sit there quietly. And then another coach will come in and help you or you'll know that, hey, when I saw this rep, I wasn't sure if it went this way or if it went that way and if it needed to be fixed. And then you can discuss that with your mentor and increase mm -hmm. your own capability. But don't sit there on the platform and, and convey a lack of confidence. Um, either or either fix the communication style if that's the problem, or fix the skill level if that's the problem, or or both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually confidence comes from competence, mm -hmm. and as that increases and their knowledge increases and experience increases, uh, so does their 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 presence changes. And this guy was uh, competent. Have... He, he was just young, so mm -hmm. he he needed to learn how to communicate with the adults in a way where he's pushing them around basically right like you got to grab people mm -hmm. you got to tell people what to do it's uh, it's mm -hmm. not normal for a for a nice young man to tell someone twice his age to do something directly and, and not mm -hmm. in a question form either but more of a command so that's a useful and skill that's one of the things that's one of the things that you know comes with time and life experience and and um i i get questions sometimes like hey am i too young to become a coach um, what's the youngest starting strength coach, you know, and I tell them a lot of this has to do with life experience. Mm. And can you communicate with somebody who's, you know, a 55 year old uh, executive who's mm. short on time and, and has very clear ideas of what he wants? And, and, you know, can you communicate with a mother who has just gotten back from, you know, giving birth and she's frustrated and, you know, has got her hands full, you know, can you, do you have the maturity, the life experience to communicate with them in mm -hmm. addition to, you know, getting through the coach development process and, and learning um, how to get people moving in line with the model. So there's a lot that goes into this and the people who apply for this job, uh, we're looking for people who, you know, have that willingness to learn, to receive feedback, um, and who really um, fit this role based on personality, not just skill set. The skill we can teach. Yep. Uh, it really requires a particular personality. Yep. Totally agree. Yeah. And um, I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about the gym owners and how you uh, how you select. You know, how did you how do you select the gym owners? that are going to be buying into the franchise. I know now Luke Schroeder is head of development, uh, business development. Um, but when you were designing this franchise, what was the selection criteria to evaluate prospective gym owners um, and thinking about franchise ownership, you know? Yeah. Well, the first thing is, uh, <clears throat> is your head and heart in the right place? Are your head and heart in the right place? Uh, do I like you? Can we get along? And those are subjective. Um, we have a distinct culture here. We have a, a document that we'll link to in the description where Ripito outlined the corporate culture of the Asgard company, corporate in scare quotes. Mm -hmm. I've got a document that I wrote called the, the, uh, our values at starting strength gyms, which we'll mm -hmm. put into the description. Mm -hmm. And basically we want people that align with our values. So we send people, we, we have a conversation with people and make sure that they're normal, um, they're good communicators, they're motivated by the right things, by helping people. Um, 
no red flags. Like if someone kind of is shitty or kind of cruel or um, defensive, defensive or kind of know it all. I had a guy mm -hmm. tell me once who, who wanted to buy uh, three gyms in Salt Lake City. Um, I drove four hours to meet him. He drove a few hours to meet me. We met in the middle. He seemed a little bit irritated that I asked him to drive that far. I thought meeting in the middle was a pretty good compromise. Most franchise yeah. companies make people fly to them. When we sat down, he said, yeah, well, all you got to do is find me a coach and then I'm ready to sign. So that was, that was a deal breaker because yeah. it's not my job to find you a coach. You're, you're the franchise owner. And so that, that it's just the, the subtle, it's the subtle behaviors and the subtle, um, sense of entitlement in the negative situations that, that can explain what this person is going to be like to deal with. So in this mm -hmm. case, what he was communicating to me, and this guy was an academic, by the way, see, and, and he, you could tell he had a big ego and you could tell he, he, uh, was used to speaking to people in a certain way. Cause he's just pushing, mm -hmm. pushing around college kids all day. Right. It's like, man, that, that attitude is not going to fly here. And it's not, it's not about my ego. It's just about the fact that I don't want you thinking that I owe you something. I don't want you thinking that I'm here to work for you. Instead, I want you thinking that this is my business and I need to bust my ass to make it successful and I'll take whatever help I can get. And then if you have that attitude, every single person on the team will bend over backwards to help you. Yeah. But if you're entitled, it's not gonna work out. Yeah. Just like another franchise prospect, we had a guy that we were talking to, we were thinking about letting in near one of the gyms that we have group ownership of. So we could test what it's like to have two gyms with different owners that are near each other. We've been hesitant to do that. And uh, this, this happened twice, actually. So the first time, the, the prospective franchise owner was trying to poach coaches from the gym she was training at. And it's like, well, we haven't signed yet. Thank, thank goodness. Because if you're behaving like this before we've signed, we can't, we can't trust you to make good choices. That's not ethical. That's not win-win. That's not looking out for us or the gym owner. That's looking out for you. Yeah. And if you behave like that, we can't work with you. Similar, similar situation, same gym. We had a conversation, then we get an email back, and it's a long email basically stating, uh, these are the things I want changed in the franchise agreement, which is non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we also want a discount on the franchise fee, and we want a discount on royalties. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> is that how you think business is conducted? Are you out of your mind? Well, so, yeah. uh, that, the that answer is yes. Yeah. The culture yeah. doesn't align. Um, if your philosophy on business, if your philosophy on life, if how you treat other people, if how hard you work and the values that you have don't align with ours, we don't want to work with you because this is about a whole lot more than money. This is about a whole lot more than money. When I wake up in the morning, I want to enjoy my job. When my phone rings and it's a franchise owner, do I want it to feel like it's an old friend calling me that I'm excited to answer the phone for? Or do I want to go, oh, fuck, this guy again, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible to get it perfect. We've made two or three mm -hmm. mistakes so far that have been resolved. Um, yeah. But when we find the good people, and we have done a very good job of finding the good people. You I have. mean, you name it from our roster. We have. You have. I love our franchise owners. There isn't a mm -hmm. franchise owner that I wouldn't let sleep in my house that I wouldn't cook mm -hmm. breakfast for. You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and I, I do that from time to time when, when people are in town, um, and the talent, the skills these people have, you've got John Hahn, who's president of a production company, very talented mm -hmm. entrepreneur. His gym is number five in the franchise and he's in Memphis, Tennessee, a small, a small market. JD Shipley, an engineer, just an absolute killer. Brent Carter, an old school fitness industry guy who's now turning into a mogul. He's got five gyms. He's purchased three that are open with plans to do 20. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to stop naming names because I don't want to leave anyone out and, and hurt their feelings. But you just you go down the list of people that are involved in this franchise. Jay Livesey, a wealthy guy, pro golfer, been around sports and athletics. Um, really good judgment, you know, just uh, just sharp thinker. Um, these are people that I go to for advice. These are people that I kick ideas around from. These are people that, when they have an idea for me or a concern about the way we're doing things, I really want to listen. Because I'm not thinking to myself, well, this person is just thinking about themselves and has it out for us and doesn't care. I'm thinking this person has really good feedback and is bright and wants what's best for starting strength because they're bright enough to know that if they do things that benefit the brand, it benefits them too. Yeah. So yeah. The, the franchise owners are a group of very, very special people. And the coaches are a group of very, very special people. 
-hmm. and the franchise team is a group of exceptional people. And that, that is what life and business is all about. The quality of your life depends on the quality of your relationships, whether it's in mm -hmm. your family, mm -hmm. your friends, mm -hmm. or in business. And I mm -hmm. work with my friends, and I work with my family, and we all do business together. So I get all three. And if you can have quality relationships from the, from the moment you wake up to the moment you fall asleep, and everyone you wor are working with is someone that you enjoy working with, and it's a, it's a pretty cool situation. That, that's kind of everything. Yeah. All the other stuff is secondary. Yeah. It's like, how much do yeah. I enjoy my day? Am I having a good time? Because I like to work hard, but I only like to work hard if it's towards something that I care about with people that I enjoy working with because nothing gets yeah. done by yourself, especially yeah. with my skill set. My skill set is about bringing people together to build something special. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you um, you had mentioned your article on our values at Starting Strength Gyms. It was one of my favorite articles. And one of the values was uh, iteration. Yep. And um, that is one of the things that's remarkable about these gym owners is we collaborate together. Uh, they will collaborate together and share ideas and help each other grow and, and, and share what best practices they have and um, help to solve problems. And um, in addition to the other values which you listed, uh, iteration was uh, is, it's a very important one, and it really reflects how everybody works together and, and how important it is to choose the right people um, to build on those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, because the gym owners are really, I've never seen it anywhere else in the fitness industry. The fitness industry is a competitive, competitive market, mm -hmm. whether you're an instructor, whether you're a gym owner. I've never had a positive experience being in the fitness industry. I had to build my own gym, my own hub of people. Uh, but here at Starting Strength Gyms, the gym owners share experiences together and improve the company overall through that iteration. Yeah. Um, so it's extremely the, important. The number of things do. that we've improved just from our first four gyms, you know, from, from JD, from Brent, from Jay Livesey, the feedback that these guys have given us, because they were essentially the beta testers. They got a discount on their mm -hmm. franchise fee because everybody knows if you're going to be first, there's going to be problems. Mm -hmm. So when there are problems, what do you do? Well, you talk it out and figure out the best solutions. And uh, we, the problems that we had were pretty minor. And uh, we, we fixed most of them, if not all of them, to a degree that makes mm -hmm. me quite happy. And mm -hmm. this thing's a well-oiled machine at this point. It's, we've, I feel like we've got it figured out. Uh, yeah. You know, that's not to say it could all come crashing down with the impending economic doom, but um, there's no there's no reason to be negative other than uh, other than freaking yourself out. So all we can do is be optimistic and then push yeah. forward and know there's a yeah. potentially a storm coming and we're going to weather it and then all shit is temporary. Whether you're injured uh, because of a little tweak in the gym or or there's an economic downturn, all bad things come to an end and turn into good things in most cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you have a team like ours, they're in it for the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. This is an important, this is a very important part of their life. And uh, everybody here is as tough as nails and practices uh, mental toughness under the bar and we'll all pull together when the, when the time is necessary. I have full, full confidence. And there's, there's one more value that I always, um, that I used to look at and wonder why did Ray, uh, write down this value in particular? And, and the value is gratitude, which you don't really see in most, uh, in most companies and most organizations. Tell me why you chose to list gratitude as one of the values. <laughs> it's, it's so strange for two reasons. On one hand, you have people that are totally uncomfortable with compliments and graciousness. And then on the other hand, you have people that use it in kind of a buzzwordy sense uh, as like some kind of a new age yoga hippie dip thing. And some of those people are genuine and, and a lot of those people are full of shit or are just trying to kind of convey a, an image, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't care about any of that. The word is meaningful, the word, the word is useful, so I used it. What does gratitude mean? Gratitude means mm -hmm. Ina. I am unabashedly thankful to you for being such a fervent supporter of starting strength. You, uh, I don't know if this is an exaggeration. You might kill people for Ripito. That's the level of loyalty and dedication you have. And you've been- Like Jacob here says, I'll show up dirty. <laughs> a true soldier. <laughs> um, so you, uh, you have been supportive of me from the moment you and I met during all the bullshit and the politics that happened in the, in the early days of this thing. 
And then whatever it is that we need, you're down, you're game. You just name it and you're, if I need help getting videos out of the gym owners, then you'll call every single gym owner and you'll tell them why video is good for them and you'll help them get it done. So why would I not let you know how grateful I am for that? Because number one, it makes, I'm, I may be unique in this, but it makes me feel good to tell you when something went well and I'm happy about it. I feel better. Mm-hmm. And I also like it when people let me know that something that I did specifically to improve their situation, improve their situation. Um, I love that. I love it when, when that's part of the reason why I love being a coach. So again, it all comes down to how much do you enjoy your day? And when people are grateful and they're, they notice the hard work and they can tell you're going out of your way for them. And then everybody's doing that for each other. It just builds this, mm-hmm. this flywheel of positivity. And mm-hmm. I want to be happy and positive and optimistic. That's the frame of mind I want to be in. And to be an effective leader, to be an effective business administrator, I must be in that state of mind. And gratitude helps me get there. And gratitude also helps the people that are going out of their way time in the day, money they could be making elsewhere, all this other stuff, that's the fuel. That's the fuel that keeps them going. And it's only fuel if it's real. And at this company, it's real. And you see it especially when the franchise owners meet with us face-to-face and are so gracious about the amount of effort that we put in to, to make their situation better. And that's the same thing that they experience with their customers in the gyms. Mm-hmm. Because the members are paying good money to be at those gyms, but they're still so grateful that they get the quality of life enhancements that they get by training at the gym two to three days a week. Those are the main reasons. And then the other reason is I just don't think there's enough, there's there's just too much negativity and bullshit in the world. And I'm fucking sick of it, you know? Um, I, I, want, uh, I want this whole business, everything we're doing to be almost entirely positive. I want, I want this to be all about making people better. I want to make our members better and live better lives. I want our coaches to have better jobs, making more money where they're more satisfied and happy. I want our franchise owners to have freedom so they don't have to have a boss and financial independence. And I want every single person on the franchise team to do the, to do work that they enjoy. And hopefully someday when we get to where we are making a bit of money, have a financial reward too. And so gratitude is the glue that binds all that together. I love that, Ray. And it's absolutely true. And it's really, it's, it's, it's apparent at every time we get together, the whole crew, the coaches, the gym owners at our conference, uh, there's a lot of love there and respect and gratitude. And I'm thankful to you every day that you gave me this opportunity uh, when things went south in 2020 and I lost my gym and I lost my people, you know, I lost my, um, my crew of people where I built my own little ecosystem. We had our own values, right? We were isolated away from the, the, the usual garbage from the fitness industry. And I thought I'm never going to be able to recreate this, you know, and then here's starting strength gyms, you know, giving me the opportunity to help people find a meaningful career, to help gym owners build their dreams. I mean, to work with someone like you that feels like a long lost brother, mm-hmm. uh, I'm grateful. And I, I'm looking forward to bringing more people uh, to the gyms and to this career in coaching. And Ray, I am 100% sure and I'm 100% positive that there's nothing but success for the gyms. It doesn't matter if there's ups and downs. The long-term uh, goal is going to be achieved. It's got its own momentum and the people behind it are relentless because we're all strong, we're all mentally tough and we're all in it for the right thing, for the right mission. Three months ago, I would have said, stop talking like that. We've got work to do. <laughs> but now we're cash flow well, positive can... and nothing, nothing's going to change about the, the speed and the quality and the intensity of the work. But mm-hmm. what that tells us is back to the scientific experiment. Business is just a scientific experiment. You have a hypothesis, you run it through a series of tests. It either is correct or it's false. We had dozens of hypotheses to prove with this, with this multi-tiered business model to ensure these incentives are fully aligned and people are getting value at every level of the value chain. And we've proven the hypotheses to the extent that this business can keep itself afloat just in the royalties that we bring in for members. And at the current moment, 
the gyms are bringing in almost half a million dollars a month and roughly have a thousand members across the 16 gyms. Amazing. That's pretty cool. You know, that's value created out of thin air. That's uh, money being spent and, and people getting benefit that uh, was not happening prior to us deciding to bring this thing to market. So I agree with you. <laughs> I think this is going yeah. to be huge. Thanks. I think we've only just started. <laughs> I think we're yeah. really well positioned. And you mentioned competition earlier. The other thing is I operate like we have no competition because yeah. nobody's doing strength training. And I'm not aware of anyone doing ethical business at scale where there's, mm -hmm. when you walk into a gym, instead of being met by a salesperson trying to get money out of you, you're met by a consultant who's trying to understand your situation to see if we can help or not. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think we're onto something really special and I think we're at a very yeah. important inflection point in the business. And I'm gonna keep saying it because I think it's true. And when we have a billion impressions annually from our storefront signs across 100 gyms, we are going to be a household name. Everybody's gonna know who we are. And everyone's mm -hmm. also gonna know that no one can touch our level of quality. And I'm excited to build that. Yeah, yeah. it's the new fitness industry. That's right. We Just have like arrived. Says. Yep. He has a way with words, doesn't well, thanks he? Well, uh, thanks for joining me today on your own podcast. <laughs> it was great hanging out. <laughs> Things have gotten so busy that if we want to have an hour conversation, we have to schedule the podcast. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Great. Maybe the next podcast we could talk about um, simplifying complexities. Since you're the expert at it, we can talk about all the ways <laughs> that we simplify complexities. <laughs> You've been reading my LinkedIn profile, haven't you? That's like 10 years old. <laughs> That's so oh, funny. Ray, I'm all about LinkedIn right know, now. So everybody watching this can find me there. And if you're mm -hmm. looking for a job in coaching, connect with me on LinkedIn. And yeah. Ray, you've got a lot of good gems on LinkedIn that, that you've put out. Thanks. Um, one that I really enjoyed about remote work. Yep. But we can, we'll save that for next time. Yep. Yeah, I've got a lot to say about business. Business is my passion, definitely more so than strength training. It's my thing that keeps me going. I really, really love it. It, uh, it's creative thinking, it's execution, it's grit, it's tenacity, it's financial risk. It's uh, it gets my blood flowing. I love it, and I've got a lot to say about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, most people don't care, so I keep it mostly to myself. Except LinkedIn is where you go for that kind of thing. And then this podcast, there I talk a little go. bit, a little bit about business because. What else am I going to talk about? You know, I'm a starting strength coach, but uh, yeah. we've covered most of that stuff already. So, yeah, yeah. I'll, keep, I'll keep sharing what I think is relevant. I would love, I would love to, you know, to sit down with you and, and do a business podcast because um, I'm all about that. And I absolutely, what I love about starting strength in the gyms is that you can really get your hands into it. You know, it isn't just uh, this theoretical business you're building; it also has its expression physically under the bar. Yep. And um, and there's a lot, and there's a lot of carryover between the training and the business, uh, the business end of it. So maybe I'll tell that's you something what, we'll tackle. For those people watching, if you want to hear a podcast about business, um, you know, there, I don't know how many of you are left after an hour of this conversation, but if you're mm -hmm. still here, uh, go read my article on startingstrength.com called Gym Business Fundamentals, and I'll link that in the description too. And then let me know what you want to hear about on on a future podcast, and if a few of you mention that or upvote it, then we'll do an episode on, on business or the gym business, or just tell us what you want to hear about. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks, Ray. It was good to finally chat with you for a little bit. <laughs> that was way easier. Thank you. I'll just be on this side more often then. It's my pleasure. I could do this all day. <laughs> Thank you, Ina. See Take ya. care.